All right, guys, bang, bang. I am super excited about this conversation uh, because I was just telling Denise that she has a, uh, an amazing job. I'm, I'm frankly jealous of what she gets to do every day. So thanks for uh, taking the time to do this. Thanks for having me. For sure. Uh, for those that don't know you and your work, maybe let's just start uh, kind of what did you do uh, growing up and then also from an education standpoint in order to, uh, to start down this path? Well, so here's the funny thing, you know, I do like mental and decision coaching with psychoanalysis or variations there, but I started out working for IBM. And I mean, I really started out in college. I'm a nutrition and dietetics and biology major thinking I was going to do something in healthcare. Um, then got swayed by IBM and thought I was going to climb the corporate ladder and was like doing great and having big accounts and getting awards. And then I thought, oh my gosh, if I wake up at 40 and I'm selling computers, like, <sighs> so, uh, I ditched an opportunity to go to business school uh, on a leave of absence and finagled my way into a program at the University of Chicago, a master's program where you can kind of design your own. Um, and that was in what at the time was called biopsychology, which is like, okay, if we have a psychology, like what's the biology of it? Like what is the brain doing really? It's now called neuropsychoanalysis, but back then. But anyway, and then I was like, literally, I swear, this is true. Like, took a left turn in downtown Chicago with a friend of mine who had been a floor trader at the SIBO, the options exchange, and like became a trader with no plan. Like, like, and before I'd always been like, what's my plan or what's my, blah, blah, blah. and then that really ultimately led to this. Um, so it's a, it's a wacky story, really. And so what exactly do you spend all day doing, right? I think when people hear things like psychoanalysts uh, and, and um, all of kind of the cool, sexy terminology, they say, I know that's important and uh, I don't want to talk to that person because they're going to analyze me. <laughs> uh, but, but what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? So like I literally just got off the phone with a small hedge fund manager who's been in business for 20 some years. Uh, he's got lots of things going on. He's got like a, a private investment vehicle. He's got a guy that's had COVID and is maybe not recovering. And so like we just went through everything that's on his plate. Um, and he's thinking out loud with me and I'm helping him, you know, sort through what he thinks and what he feels about each situation. Um, so that he can figure out like what he really believes and what he wants to do. And, it, and this is a call that I didn't really feel like I did much other than listen and provide a few sort of observations. And he was like, oh, Denise, this is so helpful. But it's like, because you don't get the time to just sit back and talk to someone about like everything that's going on in your business and have that person understand and reflect and ask some good questions. At its core, I'm always looking for what is the person feeling about what they're saying? Like he was talking about having two different possibilities for this it's called special purpose access vehicle, like a company to invest in. Um, and at first he described the one company and then he described the other company. I was like, oh, he definitely wants to go for the first one. And so I reflected that back. I think he goes, no, 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 no. Like, well, they started telling me all the, so it's a lot of listening, reflecting, helping the person really just understand themselves better and, and get clarity. I mean, sometimes I psychoanalyze, but like I have another client, a private equity guy. He's always saying to me, Denise, what's your psychoanalysis with me? What do you really think of me? Well, I have yet to tell him because it won't help him for me to tell him. In, in those situations, right, how much of it is when um they are just listening to you or you're just listening to them versus uh, you're actually giving them feedback. Like the value of just sitting and thinking out loud and talking through it. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I know what to do because I just had to sit and think about it versus you're sitting there and saying, ah, you're thinking about this wrong or you're being incredibly biased and, and, and actually uh, almost acting as like guardrails mentally. How do you balance the value between those two things that you provide? Yeah, I, I say I never give advice. Now that's 
less true than it used to be. Um, it's been particularly less true during this crazy market period. Um, but I think of it in terms of, I create my own analysis of what that person's going through, what's really happening for them, like where they're conflicted, what they're confident in, that they probably can't see for themselves because it's just too hard to see for yourself. And then I try to ask questions such that then they'll figure out what I see. But what tends to happen is, uh, I do, you know, people do end up trusting me and because I have some market background and they want to know what I think. I'll sometimes early on the client and say, will say, well, how would it be helpful to know what I think? Um, I think my skill is really helping them know what they think, like really what they think and getting out of their heads, you know, and, and understanding what their intuition is, what their experiential pattern recognition is. You know, or like, or where they're conflicted. Like, like I had a guy, another client, well, this is the one that I don't want to psychoanalyze. Um, or I don't want to tell him what my psychoanalysis of him is. Um, which by the way, I'm not even allowed to do psychoanalysis. <laughs> That's a whole other problem. Um, he wants to be a leader. Like that was really why he hired me, to be more of a leader in his small organization. Um, but yeah, like he's really afraid of stepping out and taking a risk or afraid of disagreeing too much or even really kind of afraid of being seen. So I'm like, okay, let's make a list of the things you want and what it takes and let's make a list of the fears you have. I, didn't, I could see that they were in conflict, right? And I bet you can see they're in conflict as I explained it to you. But it wasn't until he wrote them down in paper, he's like, wow, I can't have this if I've got that. I didn't tell him that. I, I often give, you know, little pieces of homework, you know, make a list of, write down this versus that to help people come to realizations. But. Yeah, it, it makes a ton of sense. And, and I guess you've done this for a long time and you've come up with your own method uh, as to kind of how to, how to think through some of this stuff. So maybe help us understand uh, how uh, the method works and then we can get into uh, more of just like how the brain works, how it processes risk and, and all that. But what exactly is this method um, you've built? Well, it assumes that how someone feels is the most important thing and that there's always a good reason for why the person feels the way they do, like in their circumstances, in their situation. So it has like, ultimate respect and it gives ultimate respect for whatever the person's experience of their world is that's different you know that's different than a lot of methods that might have like a cognitive bias you know you're making this thinking mistake um we're not like that we sort of assume that you're all, you ha you have some conflicts between things that are important to you on different time frames um, but basically everything makes sense. It's a matter of helping you sort it out. I think of it then as helping figure out what emotions they're conscious of, like what they know about themselves and what they don't know about themselves. Like the conscious emotional constellation and the unconscious emotional constellation and where the unconscious one is getting in the way of whatever they want consciously. Um, but it's very, you know, it's very empathetic. It's very respectful. It's very, it makes so, like, we know it makes sense. It's just figuring out what's unconscious and what's in conflict and then leading them to it. And in the process though, what you find is some people want to know everything. Like, tell me, tell me, tell me, want to know. A lot of people like want to know, but then they have a whole list of reasons why no, that's not right and that's not going to help me. So we categorize that as resistance in the same way a psychoanalyst would, but differently than most methods. We don't just try, we don't try to break through the resistance. It's not about like, we try to work with it so that the person changes on their own and the ch person comes to realize it on their own. Yeah, and I, I guess part of this is, um, 
you have the pleasure of talking to what I'll call the full stack, right? Everyone from uh, somebody who is a young person who wants to become a leader in an organization to somebody who is kind of, uh, we'll call it middle management or, or middle of their career and, and uh, maybe ha uh, happy where they are and just want to uh, get some better performance or may not be happy and, and kind of want to accelerate. But then you also talk to uh, the absolute best in the world as well. And so as you've been doing this, what are some of the things that you've noticed um, the best investors, traders, um, what do they do that separates them from everybody else? Is it simple mm. things or are they more complex and nuanced? Like the, the top 1%, what separates them mentally from everybody else? Well, if it's market, investing and trading, they understand that the market is just a social game that there's no like absolute, that it's really just perception. Like, and it's waves in the ocean, the perception changing. And so they're, they're trading against other people's perception and whatever, you know, however they analyze it, whether they use technical analysis and charts or fundamentals and, you know, value, that's just like a clue to how people's perception is changing. So they just, understand the market as human beings like waves in an ocean and it's a really different way to like to have internalized the market plus they use their feelings i mean they really do use their feelings like they know that conviction is an emotion and they can tell the difference between when they're convicted in something for the right reasons or when they're like agitated and, and, and compelled to do something, but it's for the wrong reasons, like, you know, another investment didn't go well, or the IRS showed up, or, um, like, in my mind, they're using their, they're using their brain, the way the human brain is really designed, um, which is something I think neuroscience is really just starting to reveal to us, and kind of the assumptions we've had about it, centuries if are wrong but they like intuitively come to that like they through their experience they they get the model of what's happening right and they get like a mechanism of how thinking about it works best right and do you that feel like that that almost um it sounds like it reduces the pressure of, of some of the decision making right if, if there are no absolutes if you're simply playing this social game uh, and the market is a signal of uh, how everyone within that market uh, feels. It feels like that's a little bit less um, of a pressure situation than uh, if I said to you, you're going to be right or wrong on a daily basis. Is that direct shocked? Yeah, I think that's true because it's, it's not like you have to find a secret answer that's lurking out there, you know, behind the clouds. And you're, 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 you have less of a feeling that you're searching for the holy grail and more of a feeling that you're surfing. And so it's like, keep my balance, you know, and, and ride with the waves. And that is easier. I mean, it is easier. Yeah. And, and would it be fair to say the other thing that you said um, that I, th I think I understand is that the best in the world are focused more on the decision making process rather than the actual decisions themselves? I think that's true. Um, I'm not sure I said it, but I think that is true. That people have a, um, you know, they have a strategy that they know at once, you know, they want to look at it this way, this way, and this way, and checks this box, checks this box, checks this box. Now, they also understand that they're predicting an unknowable future, because that's what it is, right? Like, none of us know what's going to happen in half an hour, let alone tomorrow. Or, um, and by the way, the brain it, it works on a prediction, prediction mechanism. So again, they're like in concert as opposed to creating friction. Um, but we always say that like knowing the way that you interact with the market, like whatever your strategy is and sticking with it is definitely the better way to go about it. So that's a process. It, it, like it's your, whatever your process is. Yeah, explain that more, right? So like, is that a discipline thing when you say kind of understanding uh, almost like your circle of competency and, and just sticking to that? Well, it's how you understand, it's like knowing, 
through what lens does the market make sense to you? Like I'll often, like on Twitter, I'll put, I'll tell people, figure out what your philosophy of the market is and what your philosophy of stops are. Like people will be like, what's she talking about? Well, you know, you, first of all, we do everything based on past experience and like the, the scaffolding of beliefs. So it helps to know what you believe because like all of the information you're, you're interpreting through your beliefs. So I'm saying, look, make sure you know what you believe. There are a million different ways to make money in the market. You just have to figure out like what yours is. Just like, you know, there's a million different ways to play football, baseball, basketball, right? Like people have their, their specific combination where it's the same. So you got to figure out what that is. Like, how does the market make sense to you? Like, what's your analogy for it? Like, does surfing do it? Because it's not a sport like, but it's not a sport like football or baseball. Um, and then how do you learn to stick with it? And how do you understand when you're confident in what you're seeing and when you're not? Um, how do you learn to make choices when you're reasonably confident, but not too confident, not overly confident? Which is a process of knowing like your own, you know, feelings, like knowing yourself. Yeah, you've mentioned uh, kind of confidence or conviction a few times. Uh, and, and one of the things that's always fascinated me is uh, those two lines uh, are very blurred. Uh, and also, uh, somebody can um, be convicted when everyone else isn't. And if it goes well, they look back and they say, wow, that conviction was a, um, an incredible ally to uh, sticking with something and, and it ends up working. But obviously, if you are convicted in something and it ends up being wrong, then people look back and say, no, you were just almost religious about that, whether it was investment or trade or whatever, and it ended up leading to your demise. How, how does that break down mentally in terms of, it's the same conviction, right? But, but it's almost uh, driven somewhat uh, in hindsight by what the outcome ends up being. How do you think through that? Well, what I ask people to do uh, is like, think of every single word they can possibly think of that relates to conviction or is like a degree of conviction. Um, and then rank those, come up with some sort of ranking. I usually do one to seven from like the least convicted, which people will use panicked or terrified, you know, the opposite, like to overconfident, you know, overly convicted, if you will, like you're referring to. Um, and always know where you are on your scale. And you're going to move, you know, you're going to move from, let's say, a six to a three. But you want to be able to have a word for a, a degree of or an intensity of. And you want to be able to have a word so that, number one, you're, you're ranking it for yourself. And you're getting to know literally your own physical experience of being convicted. But then when it gets like, you're so sure this can't go wrong, that's like red flag, you know, flashing red lights, like when you're, so you know, when you start to cross that line. I found over the years of doing this, that the best trades come out of this calm feeling that you're right. Like you're just sure, I'm just right. Like I just know it's right. And at the same time, you're like, I must be missing something because it can't be this easy. Like, and being able to have both of those feelings at the same time, where the, the confident one isn't energized, isn't like do, 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 do. It's just like, I just know, I just know. But I must be missing something because it feels too easy. How can I know this? Time and time and time and time again, clients tell me their best trades come out of that combination of feelings. So we try to figure out where that is on like a scale of one to seven. Yeah, it's very interesting that uh, it almost sounds like the preparation of having a system, right, or, or the scale, as you said, uh, and always being almost able to gut check, right, and, and measure. Uh, it really sounds like awareness, like the self-awareness aspect of this is uh, super, super important uh, because it is able to identify the bias that someone may have in their decision-making process. Yes, it, the self-awareness is everything. So I think of it in terms of 
leading people to that and then giving them tools, you know, to develop it, like mechanisms to develop it and track it. Um, you know, bias to me is a slightly different thing because I think the more truly self-aware you are, the less you're subject to the typical um, cognitive biases. Yeah, that makes sense. And then how do, uh, in times of uncertainty, uh, like we have right now, right? Earlier you talked about unknowns and, and the future being the biggest unknown, but right now it's less about uh, the future unknown. I think there's just a lot of uncertainty, uh, which seems tangentially related, but, but, but uh, almost worse. Uh, how do you talk to people about uh, processing information, making sure that they have the sound decision making, and then really operating in a, in a time where um, every decision, every action feels like it just has more weight on it. Um, and, yeah. and, and that there's a lot of uncertainty in the air. So the first skill is just to be able to sit with it. It's literally just to be able to tolerate the uncertainty and go, you know what? I can't make what I think is a good prediction or a good bet. Um, that's a skill, like a lot of people can't do that. And I think we're seeing like a lot of decisions being made that are about assuaging the fact that that's an uncomfortable place to be. Because when you make a decision, it feels a little bit more certain just because you decided, even though, you know, the California schools are my example of that. Like a week or so ago, they said, you know, no classes in the fall. I'm like, on May, whatever it was, 15th, they didn't need to make that decision, but it made them feel like more certain. So there's the skill of just being able to tolerate it. Then there's like making lists of, okay, what, what do we know? What's not knowable? Um, what can we maybe find out a little bit more about? And when do we really have to make this decision? Like I know someone, you know, startup company, New York, thinks that they've heard me talk about like, do I really have to make the decision and for what period of time? Um, you know, their lease is coming up, I don't know when, I think it's in the fall. And the staff has all been like, are we going back? Are we going to sign the lease? And the CEO has been like, I don't know, not making that decision today. We don't have to make that decision today. But again, like, how do you do that? You're just, you have to be able to tolerate the fact that you don't know. So, there tends to be a bias for action. And I think that bias for action is somewhat misguided. Um, you know, there's this idea that people default to inaction. I think it's generally the other way around. People want to do something to make the feelings go away. I mean, just live with the feelings, you'll figure out a better thing to do as time unfolds. I've always thought of it, uh, whether it's right or not, as uh, people want to feel in control, right? And the way that you feel in control is that you, that you do something. I can impact the situation, whether it ends up being a good impact or not. Uh, and one of my favorite studies, I can't remember if it was Vanguard or Fidelity, you know, somebody did a, a analysis on the best performing uh, accounts they had. And uh, in the retail sector, it was people who had forgotten their passwords or died. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Because it, it, was, it was just they didn't do anything. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And my, so, fa my father was one of those just because he literally started buying stock and he never sold any. I don't, he didn't know how to sell any. He put stock in dividend reinvestment programs and just, he wouldn't have known how to sell. Yeah, it looked, it probably wasn't a bad strategy. I guess the other aspect of kind of uncertainty, and especially right now, I think is um, um, a time where people are thinking about this is fear, right? So uncertainty to me feels like, uh, again, if you pull out a scale, um, it's not on the easy end, but it's not on the most extreme of, of the hard decision making. It's just an uncomfortable uh, aspect right. of the scale. Fear is like the extreme end of, uh, I am literally scared I'm going to lose money, make a bad decision, you know, whatever it ends up being. How do you talk to, uh, especially large asset managers, right? Where that fear, if it ends up becoming reality, uh, they don't just lose 20 bucks, right? We're talking, you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars, other people's money. Um, how do you talk to them about fear and, and kind of walk them through uh, when they are fearful? Yeah, so 
a superpower question to be able to answer is what am I feeling and why am I feeling it? So I try to get them to put that fear into words. Um, and I oftentimes try to get them to really get to why. And so I've, I've asked for more in the past two months than I've asked in a long time. What's the worst that can happen? So again, this is something that I think is a little bit different about our method. Like we're going right at the fear. And almost universally, the worst that can happen, actually, if the person really tries to answer that question, is some version of catastrophe. You know, they go through losing money, losing investors, losing employees, losing their fun, losing their spouse. Their life is a disaster. I mean, this is a long time ago, but I once had someone tell me, and my kids are drug dealers and prostitutes. Like, it's sort of a natural human tendency to down deep in there, you have this catastrophe scenario. And you don't realize it because you're not going down the rabbit hole because you're told not to, by the way. But it's that catastrophe prediction that's like just barely, that's influencing you. And what happens is when you look at it, you go, oh, wait. Well, that's probably not likely to happen. But even if it is going to happen, there's like 100 steps between here and there that I can, you know, avert that reality. So I, that's a long-winded way of saying I get all the fears out in the open. And then we look at them. Which ones are real and which ones are exaggerated? Which ones are relevant to whatever decisions you got to make right now? Um, and which ones are irrelevant, you know, meaning they, they're about something else or they can be put off or, um, so it's like sorting through the spaghetti bowl, bowl of fear. And it's using this research that says emotion differentiation or emotion granularity, meaning like fear, panic, nervous, nervousness, worry, doubt, like all the different intensities, being able to sort through that shows you act on it less, ironically. Being able to sort through it gives you a wider range of choices and stops you from impulsively acting on it just to feel better or to feel in control or whatever. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, again, it's around awareness, right? Kind of having an understanding of what's happening makes it uh, less powerful to some degree, like the force is yeah. being acted on you. Um, the, the age old question, uh, I know somebody listening to this will ask is, uh, are the absolute best in the world ever scared or are, oh. do they have the emotional control to, to avoid fear and maybe just sit with the uncertainty or does it ever get to that point? Um, well, I haven't talked to every last single one of them. So maybe there's somebody out there that's, you know, less human than the next one, but um, it's actually, I mean, it's a strength to be able to admit fear. Like, and also in its pure form, it's a source of information. So I think the very best in the world understand it that way, that, you know, some fears are, are warning you of something you should be afraid of. Some are irrelevant. The skill is to know the difference. So, so. speaking, what are you scared of when you go to work every day? Huh. Um, what am I scared of when I go to work every day? Um, I don't know if I, I don't know. I can tell you what I realized I was scared of using my own methods in the past two months. Because I'm really good at doing it. I mean, I, I teach people to do this, and so I'm always doing this. What am I feeling, and why am I feeling it? Because I've learned, it doesn't matter how bad it is, if you get to the real why, the energy and intensity of that feeling goes like, poof, like the distraction of it. I think it's because your unconscious is trying to use the feeling to lead you to some useful piece of information, so it makes you uncomfortable. And then when you get the piece of information, it goes, okay, I've got your attention, I'll go to sleep. So, like, I don't know mid to you know late March um, when 
the you know, hospital situation in New York City was, you know, really horrifying and sad. There were a few days there where I didn't sleep that well, and I could tell I was agitated. And obviously, like, I knew, you know, like, there's ambulances, and, like, this is a horrible situation, and people are dying, but still, I couldn't, like, and then I realized, I was brushing my teeth, and I'm like, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? And I'm like, what if I have to go to the emergency room? And I realized that I had this, like, if, if me or my husband had to go to the emergency room for something else, that would be bad at that point in time, right? And literally, then I was like, oh, okay, that's what I'm afraid of. Well, that's a perfectly reasonable fear right now. And then I was no longer afraid, and I slept like a rock that night. So... It was just recognizing that I, and that was a perfectly reasonable fear. Um, I mean, I have another crazy situation that I did it with and when Kavanaugh was being confirmed, but it ends up probably not being for public consumption. <laughs> but same thing, you know, I was really agitated by it and, and got right down to the real reason that it was, so, I mean, obviously it was gonna be agitating to me as a woman and, you know, but I'm like, why is this distracting me and like preventing me from working and focusing? And then I like drilled down what it really was. And the end result was not good, but I was no longer, it wasn't disruptive. The feeling loses its ability to disrupt. Yeah, and so I guess like when somebody goes through that process, right? How do you then take, okay, I've identified what the fear is. So, you know, use the example of, uh, I might have to go to the emergency room. Do you then take that and put action into place or is it almost like this mental piece that comes with okay i now have identified what is driving the fear maybe the fear doesn't necessarily go away but uh like you said the intensity um is, is mitigated to some degree uh because there's the awareness of it so sometimes all you need is the awareness of it and then the agitation goes away like in that situation there wasn't really much I could do. I mean, like I just, I mean, I'll be personal. I have like a condition in my esophagus that it's narrowed at the bottom. So sometimes if I don't chew really, really well, the food gets stuck and I've been to the emergency room twice in my life. So like my thing was, okay, we'll make sure you chew really, 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 really well, like all the time. Um, so sometimes you get to that why. And then you see what the real thing is. And then you go, oh, this is what I need to do about that thing. And it, by the way, it's, that's like way productive because you're answering the right question. You're not off trying to get rid of the feeling because you think it's one thing and it's another. But sometimes just knowing, I mean, like I have one portfolio manager that you know keeps a zillion positions on and trades a lot. And I go to his office and we go for a walk in New York and literally we'd start walking and he'd be like, well, I have this thing and then this currencies and gold. And, you know, I was worried about blah, blah, and I'll ask a question. And the next thing I know, he's, he's on his phone going, sell such and such. And literally, as he had said to me, whatever he was worried about or conflicted, it had come to him what he should do. But it was the saying it out loud to me and me understanding. It's important that the listener actually understands that caused him to know what move he should make in his portfolio. So in other words, it could be either. It could give you an action you need to do. The action will be better over the long, because it's going to be more accurate, based on something more accurate. Or sometimes just the awareness is enough to, to calm you down. And then, you know, I don't need to do anything about that right now. Yeah, it's super interesting. Is that normally how you interact with clients? Like you go physically in person uh, and whether it's in the office or go for a walk, um, is there kind of a method behind that uh, madness? Actually, my preferred method is to be on the telephone. And it's to be on the telephone because it's kind of like being on the couch in psychoanalyst's office where you're not looking at each other. And so like, I can have my eyes closed and I'm really listening to the tone of voice and I'm really listening to the pauses and like I'm really listening to how much agitation or hesitancy is there. And if the client's not looking at me or not looking at their screen, you know, probably they're really listening to themselves, right? So that's my preferred method. So that's been a good thing for me about the lockdown. 
um, is that I've been available to a lot. But I have certain clients who just, they don't feel comfortable if they can't see me. So yeah. I go into their office in New York. And mo there's only one that's really all, ever insisted we take a walk on a regular basis. I actually left shoes in their office because I'm like, walking shoes are different from the shoes I show up in. <laughs> you make sure that they're not looking at their screens while they're talking to you? Well, I can't if it's on the phone, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can usually tell by their cadence, you know? I mean, I, I was born a really good listener, but I'm an even better listener now because I've been trained to do it and I practice doing it. And it just generally speaking, I mean, you probably know this during the podcast when you're doing I mean, it's, a, it's an art to really listen. And it's a real gift to give somebody to really, really listen. Like what, are the keys, what are the keys to good listening? No judgment. No, ju just hearing what they're saying. In a perfect world, um, and we use this, and this, will, this might sound contradictory to no judgment but like the feeling it gives us. So there's a phenomenon um, where if someone's not in touch with the feeling, but someone like, like me or my team is listening, you'll pick up on the feeling. So like I have certain clients over the years, I had one that literally in the first 30 seconds, I'd be angry, irritated. I had one that in the first 30 seconds, my dog would start barking. Like, you know, I, and I assume the dog would hear the person's tone, you know, voice, tone of voice and energy. You know, I, you wouldn't think that a human being wouldn't hear it, in, but the dog would. Um, so, no judgment. Seeing what feelings it gives you, that's what we, we call it. Um, hearing what's not being said. Hearing the, the conflict. Like they'll say, I think this, and they'll go on as if it's, it's it's coherent, but if you're listening, you realize they just said two things that are in conflict, and they don't realize it's a conflict. Yeah. It's paying attention, it's just paying, you know, it's really, the, the short version, paying really close attention. Yeah, and, and it, I've always thought about, um, you know, on the podcast, for example, when you're talking with somebody, uh, the more you focus on not just what they're saying, but how they're saying it, you, right. it's like opening up a whole new world. And it sounds like that for you is like on steroids, right? It's everything yeah. from the pauses, the cadence, the tone, you know, the inflection points, all, all of those things, uh, you're able to glean a lot of information that is what it sounds like. Yeah, I, I, like I, I can hear when someone's not telling me something, like when they're thinking something, but not telling me. And then I'll think, cause like, I know this, say everything getting someone to say everything with no embarrassment and shame on their part helps them, but they need help to do it oftentimes because they will judge themselves. They'll think there are things they shouldn't say. Um, so I, I listen for that. What do they not say? What about uh, in those moments of panic, fear, uncertainty, uh, any like late night calls where just people are freaking out? You know, people think I get that all the time, and I don't. Um, I mean, I tell my clients, you can email me or text me any time of the day or night, and I'll answer you in a reasonable period of time. I don't get that many. They just don't do it. I've had a few. I, it, it, the group of people that do it more are the athletes, but even then, they don't. I'm, well, I'm not going to say that because as soon as I say it, then it'll happen. But um, What's the big difference between the athletes and the investment professionals? People ask me that all the time. Um, I mean, I think the big difference is not so much between the people as it is the situation. So investing or trading is just wildly different than sports. You know, first of all, like the point in sports is to make something happen. Like you physically make something happen. 
the point of investing or trading is to set yourself up for something to happen. It's a completely different environment. Um, you, you know, the game ends, um, you either won or lost, like it's clear, you know, the ball goes backwards. It's not good. In investing, the game never ends. The ball goes backwards. I don't know. Is it, should you get out or is it an opportunity? Like it, the level of ambiguity in investing is, you know, orders of magnitude greater than it is in sports, which makes investing a lot, lot, lot harder than sports. Um, but as far as the people themselves, you know, athletes who are playing a team sport think of the world in terms of the people, like, just like the best investors do. Um, the athletes that, that are in individual sports, like the New York Times did an article about Lindsay Jacob Ellis and me, she's a snowboard racer. Um, you know, that's an, in, well, she's racing against four other people and she does actually think a lot about other people and how she's, um, the, and even like a pitcher I've been working with, you know, that's thinking about other people. Um, you know, I think I'm in some ways, I'm like everyone's human and everyone's brain works like human being and I'm the risk of sounding whatever, they're all the same to me. But, but I do think very much what situation are they in. Like three years ago, I had a general manager of a major league baseball team call me and I watched more baseball the following two weeks than I had watched in the preceding like 50 years of my life. Because I want to know, what does it feel like to be standing at second base? You know, what is it, I always think, like I'll even, I've even said to some clients, what does it feel like to be you? You know, what is it? That's what I want to know, because I want to help them sort through that so they're able to operate out of the feelings that are helping them and giving them information and able to avoid the ones that aren't. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Before we uh, go to wrap this up, I want to talk about uh, routines, right? Um, I, I played sports growing up. Uh, obviously, um, you listen to people, whether they are uh, the best in the world at running a business, investing, uh, or just doing some hobby. Uh, everyone always thinks about their routine, uh, but it's usually, here's what time I wake up, here's when I eat, you know, and, and it's a lot of physical action. Um, is there mental routines that either you help people structure uh, or, or patterns you've seen in high uh, achievers or high performers uh, in terms of how they think about like that mental routine they go through? Well, you know, people do things like meditating and imagery, but they use it, you know, there's not a consensus as to how people use it. I mean, I try to get them in the habit of what am I feeling and why am I feeling it all the time and then picking the action that gets them the thing that they want, like uh, making sure they get recentered in what they want frequently, you know, whether that's every day or multiple times a day, um, which is the thing you want more and in the long term is often in conflict with the thing you want less in the short term and so like instead of telling the routine i want is instead of telling yourself to do the right thing be leaning into the thing you want more and saying what have i got to do to get the thing leveraging desire like a routine of leveraging desire uh, but i'm also very non-judgmental uh, you know some people have a very like step by step i'm going to do this every day you know and other people just don't operate like that you know and I'm a totally about, let's figure out what works for you, like in your situation. And don't feel guilty that someone else does X, Y, and Z. Yeah, that, that makes sense. There's a lot of people who, uh, who wish that they could uh, hire you and spend time with you and, and uh, kind of benefit from all the great work you do, uh, but they just can't, whether it's a, uh, a, a, you know, for whatever reason it is. What's your advice to them as kind of the like watered down version of the work you're able to do where they can just get started at least being more aware um, or, or starting to implement some of the things that you do in your practice in their everyday lives. Stop judging yourself. 
like just like there's a reason you think and feel the way you do and you think and do the things you do so stop judging try to understand figure out why it is you know some of it's gonna be like if you perceive it as self-destructive it's gonna like there was a reason that developed over your life for some reason to keep you safe but just figure out what it is and then figure out what you want and work with it so what this means is don't judge how you feel just know how you feel put it into words because the more you do that the less it's going to get in your way and you don't have to tell yourself do this do this you know don't do that like ah. <laughs> makes me crazy like the discipline i just have to say this like in the brain research that like our frontal cortex is controlling us and keeping us disciplined like we're finding out that's not the way it works we're choosing what we want we're choosing how we want to feel so lots of times people choose a short-term feeling to take away an uncomfortable feeling but to get the long-term feeling they have to do something different like they have to go work out today or whatever you know or you have to stay in a trade know what you what are you feeling and why learn how to answer that question and just don't criticize yourself I love how, uh, how simple of just like, what am I feeling and why, right? It, it, it's something that's memorable and, and uh, you can do literally without uh, moving. <laughs> you could do it in your head and in the moment. Right. Um, and that makes sense. What, uh, what's the most important book that you've ever read? Ooh, the most important book I've ever read. I don't even know what it's called. It's called The Red Book in Modern Psychoanalysis. Um, it's a crazy book. Like, this is going to be the craziest answer you ever had. I think it's... It's called The Red Book? Well, it's, it, it, the, the nickname for it is The Red Book. But it literally, it's like, the actual title is something like Modern Psychoanalysis of the Schizophrenic Patient or something like that. Wow. So I'm, I'm going to say this because this matters. There's a group of psychoanalysts that are called moderns. They're different than Freudians. They don't worry about like interpreting you're doing this because X, Y, and Z happened to you as a child. But what they figured out is anger you don't know you have is a huge thing. So back to not judging yourself, like being able to know what you're angry about with no judgment can turn into a superpower. And it can actually eliminate like self-destructive behaviors, but it's so hard to do because we live in a culture where like anger is terrible and no one's supposed to be angry and don't be angry, you know, and you get so criticized for it and blah, 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 blah. The modern psychoanalysts get amazing results um, with, with really severe mental issues through understanding how to work with anger. And we've gotten, like some amazing results through helping people understand they're angry about something that when you think about it, they have darn good reason to be angry about. So let's stop judging it. Let's understand. Sometimes it's all in the past. There's nothing to be done about it, but just giving yourself the respect of, of accepting that like creates energy and it creates optimism. Um, so that's like, you know, level three or four, and I usually don't talk about it in public because people can't take it. Um, but, so. So it, it almost feels like uh, if people read that book, they will get a different perspective on a lot of this work. Is that fair? Yeah, but the average, I mean, that book's hard for even me to read. Like it's, it's written by a psychoanalyst in the 1940s or 50s. Um, there's, iron, there's irony in calling it modern if it was written in the 40s or 50s, right? Well, then it was called modern, you know. Actually, the guy that started this was like kicked out of New York psychoanalytic, which is a big deal. And like, it was probably because he said you didn't have to be a medical doctor to be a psychoanalyst. And they were all like, well, yes, you do have to be a medical doctor. He's like, no. And he actually took patients he'd cured of schizophrenia. This is a true story. Your, your listeners are going to think I'm crazy, but 
Oh, well. Um, and taught them to be psychoanalysts. Uh, and he believed that you could do that. But I, I'm trying to think of one that, um, oh, here's a great one. The Body Keeps the Score by, I, I, I'm going to get his name wrong, Vanderkirk or Vanderkirk. The Body Keeps the Score. It's a current book. And it's basically about how like things happen to us over our life and we're unable to deal with the emotions um, and they get subverted into our bodies. Which then makes me think of another one. The drama of the gifted child. What is that? It's basically about how like little kids, you know, if you're a smart little kid, you kind of figure out what your family dynamic is early on. And kids try to save their families, you know? One thing kids do, by the way, is like if there's, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever's going on in their household that's not good, kids are narcissistic, right? So they think everything revolves around them. So they blame themselves. You know, if I just behave bad, better, you know, mommy and daddy wouldn't be fighting. When you're a kid, that helps you because it gives you this sense of power and control in the situation for you, and that helps you. But you're, you know, you need to lose that as you get out of this. What happens is some people don't lose it. So they always blame themselves. Um, and then, you know, you can imagine how that gets in people's way in adult life. Um, the drama of the gifted child takes you through that, like how that happens. And I've given that to a lot of clients who are like, oh my God, this is me. Um, yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Not the typical books you're, you're that typical. <laughs> The, listen, this is why I asked the question, right? Is because I think uh, there, there's a lot of books out there that uh, are out of the mainstream, uh, kind of what's popular in investing or, or business or technology yeah. or whatever, uh, but they're great books, right? And, and so it's always fascinating to hear what, uh, what people choose. Um, I ask every single person uh, one last question, and then you get to ask me a question to end it. Uh, the question is about aliens. Are you a believer or a non-believer? If the question is yes or no, then I come down on yes. Okay, what is the logic you use to get to yes? I agree, but what is the logic behind yes? Oh, there's so much more than we can see. But the short version is, after, shortly after my father died, I went on a cruise to hear this guy talk about past life regression, which I would have never gone to except he was a Yale trained psychiatrist and my friend who was a mergers and acquisitions attorney in Kazakhstan, oil and gas, female, so she's a serious woman, said, you gotta hear this guy. So I go to hear this guy and he's got a speaker with him who does like, I guess you call it channeling, I don't even know what the word for it is, but talk to the spirit world. And I mean, even it's been, I don't know how many years, but I'm like getting agitated. My father spoke to me no uncertain terms through that guy. It was, really? uh, yeah, it was unbelievable. Uh, yeah, unbelievable. The things he knew, like it, there was no other way. It could be anything but. So there's a lot we don't know. Yeah. So therefore, if I got to choose yes or no on aliens, I'm going to come down and yes. I love that. <laughs> I've never, I've never had anyone use that, uh, that perspective to, uh, to come out on. Yes. I almost never. Oh, ever... Yes. Leave it to me. Um, so why do you believe in aliens? <laughs> my, my whole thing is, um, so one, obviously the galaxies on galaxies on galaxies that are out there, you know, it's just this vast, vast world. Um, but I actually think, uh, there's two, components and I have and I'll call up the bias of uh, I have the benefit of uh, you are uh, the 300th person I've asked this question to so I've heard a lot of the uh, the various um, uh, theories here but one is um, the definition of alien is very broad and so if you just look at something like uh, the things in the ocean there's probably things there that you I and every scientist in the world has no clue about Right, it's just it's so big, um, and, and so does that fall under kind of alien life? Right, it's just, some people would put yes, some people would say no. But on top of that, the other thing is 
Um, when you start to get into things around uh, simulation theories or uh, our ability to actually see, right? You know, and, and mm -hmm. th there's an example, uh, Dave Collum uh, from Cornell was, uh, was talking about recently, I, th I think it was him, uh, where it's like, look, if you're an ant on a highway, you only know like, I'm trying to get across this highway, right? There's like this big thing that comes, whatever, but like you don't have the intelligence to understand kind of the vast world outside of, you know, your little kingdom of the highway, right? Right. And so if you think about it from that perspective, like what are the odds that we as humans uh, were the ant in some other thing? Um, it's not necessarily high in my opinion, but it's not zero. Right. And so when you start to kind of, do math on all of the different variations of, uh, of a theory like that. It's like, yeah, th there's probability uh, would tell you that there, there's some other intelligent life out there. Uh, I, uh, I also come at it from a, let's make sure, let's hope that we're the superior intelligence, right? I, I don't know if we want to be the, the inferior one, uh, but, but I think that's going to be more luck if, of, uh, of anything. <laughs> Yeah, I, there's, we're powerless to do anything about that. But I really, I did just see an article, and it, I can't, I'm not going to be able to remember it, in a, or, but it was an incredible publication about, like, the FBI's awareness of UFO, you know. And I mean, I like, I'm not the kind of person who's going to go down that rabbit hole, right? But I saw this, and it was, like, a serious publication and a serious article, and I'm like, huh. So the, the reason why I probably, and, and I'm obviously guessing here, but uh, back in 2014 or 2015, there was um, a quote unquote leak from, uh, of these UFO videos. And this was on, you know, Reddit and Twitter and kind of went, went um, very viral in the uh, conspiracy theory world. Uh, but just recently, uh, literally during the COVID crisis, uh, the, um, I think it was the Defense Department or whoever it is in the government agency side, uh, they actually released the videos and confirmed their authenticity. And right. so I think that's probably- That what, is exactly what it was. Yeah, and, and so it, it's interesting because they basically say, look, we don't know what this is. Uh, they don't nearly go as far as kind of the conspiracy th theory world of like, hey, this is aliens or you know any of that type of stuff. But it's just, uh, this video was taken. Uh, we do not know what the, um, you know, uh, yeah, we don't know what it is. Yeah, we can't and, say what it is. And also, the part to me that that you know, Frank, I would kind of wave my hand at all of this, except for uh, very smart people, people way smarter than me, say, look, we don't have an explanation scientifically for how it moves that way, right? Yes, that, right, right. When you get into that type of, uh, you know, understanding of some of this stuff, it's like, look, th there's obviously things that we don't understand in the world, right? There was a time when people didn't understand gravity. Now we have the benefit right. of understanding gravity. Uh, I'm sure there's other things that we will discover over time, but there is this uh, allure of scientifically, if we can't explain something, but we can see it happening, like, what the hell is that? <laughs> right? right. That's right, kind right, of right, 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 right. the attention right. comes. So, all right. There's Jesus. more than we know. There absolutely is. That's the truest thing I've heard all day. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time to do this. This is awesome. I, I really Thank enjoyed you. the conversation. Uh, where can people go find you um, or, or the work that you guys are doing on a daily basis? So my company's name is The Rethink Group, and we are the rethinkgroup.net. Um, I have a website. I wrote a book called Market Mind Games, which is like taking all this psychology and applying it to, to market decision making and um, places like you. Market Mind Games. There are a lot of those going on right now, for sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing this. We'll, uh, we'll make sure we link to all of that and uh, we'll do this again in the future. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye.